I wanted to look at two issues. One was um, where the continent, the African continent is going, mm. and two is what set of skills um, will they need in the coming decade? Mm. And if I could stay um, sort of you know ahead of that uh, trend. Mm -hmm. um, so I, went, I came back to the US, went to grad school with uh, in DC at Johns Hopkins mm -hmm. University. Mm -hmm. And then um, I really didn't know what to do because within a span of five years, I was going to be an astronaut. Then I was trained to be a health worker. And then I became a Ministry of Finance expert in a country that had no electricity. So all of a sudden I was like, okay, over who am I? Who am I? <laughs> kind of question. Yeah. But the one sort of, you know how, um, People say you can plan your life, but other people might have uh, ideas about you, and that you don't. You should also kind of be open to the world's mm -hmm. ideas for you. Yeah. So one day I got a call saying, "Look, um, there's a crisis in Liberia, and um, they need uh, somebody to help in the Ministry of Finance." And since you had been next door in Sierra Leone, uh, we thought we'd put your name in. And, and who's, who's initiating this call? Oh, like, this is from the World Bank. Um, got it. Wow. Yeah. I mean, yeah. sorry, let me just pause on that. <laughs> yeah. okay, the World Bank called me and told me. <laughs> to, amazing. So I, and, and how old are you at this point? I was so. maybe about 26. Oh my 27, gosh. I think. Amazing. And, um, and so I thought, um, well, the pitch was this. They said, um, the war is over, um, it's almost to the end, um, so they need help in the national, developing the National Economic Plan. It'll be attached to the Ministry of uh, Finance. So I arrive there, and guns are going off, people are underneath their tables, oh and I called up uh, the guy who recommended me. I said, I thought you said the war was over. And he said, yeah, yeah, it's almost over. I'm like, listen. <laughs> It's not over. Oh my God. So then I was like, uh, he's. So then I went to the ministry and, and the guy said, okay, fine. You know, and a lot of times in conflict zone, they don't get the best people, the most mm. skilled people. Yeah. So he said, look, you know, we, we rarely have somebody who has had some, that kind of experience next door. Please stay and we could find other stuff for you to do. And I thought, you know, I'm not married, I don't have kids, why not? And so, and there was electricity. And no, 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 no. Okay, so there's no, no electricity. electricity. Okay, got it. Got it. So again, no electricity. <laughs> We're building a theme here. So yes. <laughs> yeah. So then I got a call from um, the U.S. ambassador there, who said, "Look, um, why don't you go figure out what's going on? The Ekamog soldiers, which is a West African peacekeeping force mm. that was sent there to keep." Um, um, the conflict under control mm -hmm. and the guy the general there said look I'm going up to this rebel territory um, if you want you can take a ride with me while they decide what to do with you uh, um, <laughs> if you're not at the finance ministry so we were driving up the hill and I always remember this because I was sitting there and we get to a checkpoint run by a bunch of kids mm -hmm. like maybe 13 to 15 year old generals with guns mm -hmm. at this checkpoint and the funniest part, the guy, the general said to me, just stay in the car and uh, I'll get us through. He's talking and talking and I'm just sitting there. And finally he waves me over and he says, uh, come down. And I get down and these kids, maybe between 13 to 20, uh, first of all, they're shocked that there is a Indian looking woman <laughs> out in the middle of nowhere with the general. And two, I sound American, so they can't put two and two together. And so finally, one of them says, "Are you Indian?" I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, I am." You know, and he's like, "We love Bollywood." <laughs> and you know, growing up in Cleveland, Ohio, yeah, yeah, you're like, kind of like, huh? I hadn't really yeah. like my parents kept us culturally aware, yeah. But movies weren't the thing. Yeah, so yeah. all of a sudden, I was like, "Oh, uh, great." <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. And so the general was kind of hinting, saying, keep talking, keep talking, you know. Yeah. So they're like, oh, do you, and they name off all these movies. And I was like, yeah, I know that one. Yeah, I know that one. Oh, yeah, that's fantastic. I had no clue what they were talking about. 
They got us through the checkpoint. Hey, so, uh, Hollywood saved your life. <laughs> yeah, basically. So then we get to the rebel camp where Charles Taylor is, that's the rebel leader's yeah. name. So we get there and the military people are having negotiations. But my thing was there were all these women and children all over the place. So I just thought, okay, I'm gonna go talk to all these women and children. So I t was talking to all these women and children and finally at some point, they were like, yeah, you know, we want school books, we want this and that. So actually my career, even though I came for economics, ended up focusing on security and ceasefire because um, uh, we were able to sign a ceasefire because the men, women, they wanted services for the women and children. And the only way we said to get you services was a ceasefire. Wow. And so then my career kind of, uh, I was there for two years. And then my name got passed to Sierra Leone back when the war started there. And I was there five years. Oh and there I was basically in charge of uh, representing the government in discussions with the rebel groups. Um, and then I went to Angola for... Um, the peace talks there, wow. and then I went to the De Dem Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, and then I was in, uh, part of the team that deployed the peacekeeping force into Darfur mm -hmm. during the crisis. Wow! So basically, I went from government to government who were dealing with um, crises, wow. either economic crises or security crises uh, or political crises, mm -hmm. and then. So I did three years in Uganda, uh, went to Nigeria, and finally I got a call from the Obama administration, the White House, White House office, and said, uh, would you be interested, we got your name from somebody, would you be interested in a position? First of all, I was like, I didn't even imagine it would happen. Wow. Um, two, I thought, wow, um, I get to come home, you know? Yeah, I'm <laughs> sure your family was excited about that. Um, and three was, um, I kind of felt, um, as somebody joked with me, you worked for every other government, why not your own? So I was like, oh, that's a good, I had not thought about that, I should try to do that. So, but throughout all those years, um, actually, I worked pretty much without any electricity wherever I had lived and any of the offices. And the most we would get is maybe two, three hours, if you could get it. And so you try to do everything in that. Mm. So I would, now I look back about it, that was sort of the constant mm -hmm. um, underlying element of all these circumstances. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> amazing, amazing. So, so you went to work for the Obama administration? Yeah. Okay, great. And tell me more, what was your um, role there? My first position in the administration was, uh, I was a senior advisor to the President's Special Envoy to South Sudan. Wow. We were, uh, sorry, President's uh, Special Envoy to Sudan okay. at that time, and our team was responsible to support the the separation of the two countries, the, wow. so that you had the new country called South Sudan, mm. and um, so I was part of the I led the security negotiations uh, in support of the envoy and the president's policy, and then after the independence, uh, I was given a senior appointment as the deputy assistant uh, administrator for Africa at USAID, okay. uh, which is sort of the uh, development arm of the foreign policy um, of the United States, and there I I, I acted significant acted as the head of the bureau for significant periods of time, and two things struck me there. One is you're constantly in this crisis uh, agenda. You have to deal with the crisis agenda, mm -hmm. you know, in life. Mm -hmm. Things happen daily that you have to manage. Mm -hmm. But I really was determined after being on the continent for 20 years to say, let us have an affirmative agenda. While we're dealing with the crises, yeah. we should also have an affirmative agenda. And what would that affirmative agenda be? Yeah. And so um, I was one of the architects for something called Power Africa, mm. where the president's, um, it's a presidential initiative. Uh, it's called Power Africa and basically President Obama 
um, sort of mobilize the international community um, to say, what can we do to increase private investment mm -hmm. into uh, getting the continent electrified mm -hmm. and powered? Mm -hmm. And so that was sort of what I, I think I'm most proud of to support the, the president in that initiative. Amazing. And so we did that for a few years. And then um, I kind of thought, um, you know, what could I do further um, outside of public sector? Which gave me the impetus to say, look, the kind of money you need mm -hmm. to, the kind of investments you need to kind of uh, move that agenda forward, which is to um, provide power to households and industries. Um, we don't have the money in the public sector. Mm -hmm. So we only could support with the private investment. So I thought, okay, I did my part to raise the agenda mm -hmm. in support of the president's initiative. What can I do from the private sector? Mm -hmm. And so now I'm kind of, I kind of said, um, this is 21st century. All our kids in the West are talking about Mars landing, you know, electric cars, self-driving, you know, AI, artificial mm -hmm. intelligence, and there is a whole continent of nearly a billion people mm -hmm. um, who have about 15% of the continent has electricity. So I just thought there's, there must be a financial model mm -hmm. and an operational model that we could introduce that would allow investors to feel comfortable that they're taking the appropriate risk mm -hmm. and governments to say we can package projects and deals in this space yeah. um, and kind of connect them and so we would like to do for um, power sector what cell towers did for cell phones on the continent which is you know you can do big things and you can do sort of micro level things but I think the space for mid-sized um, power sec power projects mm -hmm. and infrastructure mm -hmm. uh, is really critical. So my sort of startup, mm -hmm. <laughs> sort I, of startup. <laughs> I always tell people yeah. I'm like this. This agenda has been my part of my life, sort yeah. of living it, uh, working in it. Oh trying God. to raise it as a major issue for our own government yeah. to lead on it yeah and now sort of having a small area where I could say you know how do we um, change the way things are being done now um, and build upon things that are working yeah so that's sort of the effort um, and I must say one thing that it's one of the, and my company is called Yatra. Mm -hmm. And the reason I named it Yatra is um, it's in Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. It's called a journey. It means a journey with a purpose, mm -hmm. uh, with a meaning yet to be unfolded. Ah, I love it. So I sort of feel like I have this journey. I think we're bringing sort of private investment into this space. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens? from that moment on is sort of um, what how we'll transform lives of school children, health clinics, people for jobs. You know, you don't control that, but you could see it unfolding. Oh, absolutely. You know, and yeah. so that's kind this of this is the linchpin in all of that, right? Yeah. And industry and growth of businesses and you employment, know, incomes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there are two ways people are looking at it. One is to say, how do we give light to people? Mm -hmm. Which is sort of from a consumption point of view, like, you know, do I have light to read, mm -hmm. you know, watch TV, listen to the radio, all that. But there's also sort of power or electricity required for industry. Yeah. You know, how do, we, how do we take the corn out of the field and process it? How do we process the oil that's coming out of the ground? So I think the question is, how do we power for productivity and how do we power for consumption, mm. you know? And I think some people are doing well on the consumption side, you know, giving away light bulbs, mm -hmm. 
uh, solar panels. Um, and we're focused on where are the critical industries that are going to be driving the GDP of the country mm -hmm. and how much power and infrastructure is required along that uh, industry value chain mm -hmm. and where can we uh, develop projects and investments um, along that value chain. So, and the funny part about it on this whole thing is there's $120 billion in investors' uh, hands. Hmm. And they, the, co the constant um, challenge they face is they don't have a deal flow, they don't have projects. Wow. And the governments say, look, we have projects, but we don't know where the money is for the private investor. Yeah. And then the industry is like, we want to get things produced and made, get together. Yeah. You know, we and need power. you literally, I mean, seriously, yeah. all the things that you've done, I mean, this is... Like a it's like confluent. You're like literally the only person, I mean, I've like never said this before, <laughs> but I feel like, I mean, based on hearing your story, Roger, like you're the the perfect and only person on the face of the earth to do this. I mean, it's really well, amazing. I don't really. Yeah. <laughs> well, the thing about it is I have worked in government. Yeah. I've worked um, in private equity. And when I was a Peace Corps volunteer, I worked with the industries and small businesses. Yeah. So I sort of feel like it was a convergence of my life experience in some ways to be totally. at this point. Totally. And there's a lot of good work being done out there. But we sort of feel like um, saying two things. One, let us be very focused because, you know, you can solve big problems um, and have big dreams, as I did when I wanted to be an astronaut but didn't know I couldn't wear glasses and fly a plane. <laughs> um, but if we're methodical and really data-driven and um, make this a true partnership for investors and governments, uh, we really think it can kind of change the way um, the current fears on both sides can be managed well.